All right. So uh, just before I start, I want to uh, make it clear that uh, today's session is uh, for legal information. It is not for to obtain a legal opinion or a legal advice. I am a lawyer, but today the goal is really to provide you with information in general and not go through your specific cases um, and to advise you as to how you should proceed uh, in your specific case. Um, I will also be providing a list of resources at the end of the session, which will allow you uh, perhaps to get more information or to obtain those uh, legal advice and legal opinion you may be seeking as your case evolves. Um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Gabrielle uh, Beaulieu. Um, I work for La Forge Beaulieu. Um, I have been working in the family law field since I was called to the bar in 2012. So I've been practicing uh, for over eight years. Um, how did I get there? I did my articling, so my um, the, uh, the placement we need to do as lawyers for the House of Commons. Uh, completely unrelated to family law, but throughout that period, I did do a lot of uh, employment law. And I realized that what attracted me to my profession was the legal aspect, but it was also um, the human uh, characteristic of some domains. So when you lose your spouse or uh, you're getting a separation or a divorce, or if you lose your job, whether we want it or not, or life kind of doesn't go according to plan, um, it, it can be hard on some people. And my goal is to help people navigate through the process. Hence why I accepted to give this uh, presentation today. The, the goal was really to provide information to help you guys navigate through the legal process, understanding the actors and who, uh, who will interact with you through the court process, what are the different steps of the court process, what you should or should not be doing uh, when going to court. I became a lawyer partly because I, I thought everything should be fair and everything should be just. And as a lawyer, don't tell anyone else, um, but I often realize that if you're representing yourself, sometimes you get penalized, I'll say, in the sense um, for not having done things in accordance with the rules. And is that necessarily fair or just? Well, there needs to be a process, but my goal today is to try to help you, again, uh, work through the process and put your best case forward when you are representing yourselves. As I was saying earlier this morning, uh, in Toronto in the past few years, they have noticed a significant increase in the amount of people that represented themselves in family uh, law court. They were up to 90%. The main reason was because people could not afford a lawyer. Um, so lawyers, uh, there, sorry, there's been quite uh, an influx in lawyers trying to provide limited scope retainers where they can provide uh, services, but on a need base and sessions like this to help people again navigate through the system. So this session is offered by uh, La Gefo, which is the uh, French Ontarian Association of uh, Lawyers, and it's also uh, it, it has also been funded by the Ottawa Community Foundation. Now you may be from outside of Ottawa. This being said, uh, we do thank them for the, their uh, assistance in this session. Um, we'll start with the judicial roles. So who are the actors that will be part of your court process? Well, the most important usually uh, is the judge. The judge is the person who's going to act like an arbitrator and he's going to be responsible, he or she will be responsible for making decisions that are completely independent and impartial. They will base their decision on the arguments that you submit, the evidence that you submit by, they, they will base themselves uh, on the law that is currently in place. And they may all, not, they may, they'll base themselves on other Canadian uh, decisions that have 
uh, arisen in the past. Um, the, um, there's the judge and then there's the master. A master is very similar to a judge. Um, they are not in every jurisdiction. They are in the major centers, I'll say, and they uh, are there to, just like a judge, also make some decisions. Um, they have a limiter, limited scope as to what they can or cannot make decisions on, um, like they cannot make uh, criminal decisions. And they will often uh, be seen in family law at case conferences, sometimes at settlement conferences. I have yet to see a master hear a motion. How do we distinguish them? Um, the judge will wear uh, red and the master will wear, will wear, sorry, blue. So that's how you can distinguish them and they will advise you whether they, you are seeking an order outside of their scope. In the courtroom, you'll also see the court services officer. I think they kind of look like uh, security guards and the way they're dressed and the way they handle themselves. Their role, their primary uh, role is to assist the pre presiding judge. So they'll go get the judge when everyone's ready. They may escort them out when everything's done. They will also uh, be the one calling out names in the courtroom to see whether they are present. They will probably ask you, have you closed your cell phone? Asking you to leave behind your food and beverages. So they're there to ensure the, uh, again, the proper conduct of the proceeding. Another uh, agent who also will be in ensuring the proper conduct of the proceedings will be the court clerk. So the court clerk ensures that all action by the parties are coordinated and carried out in the right time. So they'll be saying, uh, they'll also, sorry, they'll explain the rules uh, of the court. They are usually the people who say, oh yay, oh yay, this uh, audience is resumed or something along those lines. Um, they will also make sure that you're turning off your phone, that there's no food, beverages, um, they will pass any documents you may want to submit to the court when you are actually sitting in the courtroom. Um, and the same goes if the judge, is, the judge sorry, wants to pass you in any information, he will also go through the court clerk to do so. The court clerk is also responsible to ask witnesses to promise to tell the truth, whether it's on a uh, religious uh, document or whether it's just uh, swearing uh, in. Um, there's also going to be the court reporter. The court reporter is simply there to uh, transcribe into writing everything that was said and done during the hearing. And while court appearances right now may be over the phone or Zoom, court reporters are still present, hence uh, why we need to be very clear when we speak. And if the court reporter asks us to repeat, we shall repeat ourselves to make sure that the transcript is going to be uh, properly made. And then there's us, so you guys and myself. Um, so as a lawyer, I'm there to represent my client, my client's interests. I will address the court on behalf of my client. And I will also uh, perhaps negotiate with the other party, whether they're represented or not. Um, any uh, actions that I make in a case are based on the instructions of my client. Um, so it's not rare that if I'm present in court that I will be the one speaking on behalf of my client and not my client himself. Um, now, if you're representing yourself and uh, the individuals I may be representing uh, are called the applicant and the respondent. So the applicant is the person who starts the family law case. He is the one who, who decides, okay, I want to go forward. I want to make my claims. I want the judge to make decisions and then submits the application itself, which is then served on the other party. And the other party is called the respondent. The respondent, as the name states it, responds to the application. So then 
they will make sure that they uh, they mention uh, in their answer whether any of the claims made by the applicant are false or they can also include the claims of their own in uh, the response material to which then the applicant will be able to respond. What I want you to be fully aware is that the judge and the court employees are not there to give you legal advice as much as you can ask them as to whether you have a good case, whether you'll win your case, they're there to be impartial and they will not give you legal advice or legal opinion. It may happen that a judge will give his opinion when a matter, sorry, when you get a hearing where the judge cannot make a ruling. So we'll go through those types of uh, of hearings, there are some hearings where the judge cannot make a ruling and in those situations they may um, tell a party in front of the other one uh, whether they have good chances of success, poor chances of success, if they were to rule. The idea behind it is simply to help people move the case forward and if someone sees that they have a good case or a bad case they may decide to not proceed to court and actually try to resolve. So those are the actors. As a self-represented litigant, you absolutely must be familiar with the family law rules. No one is going to expect you to act as a lawyer or to know the law inside out as a lawyer would. This being said, you do not have the right to say, I did not know I needed to do X or Y. You may not know the law entirely, but you have to be aware as to what kind of court date you have, how do we serve the documents, what's the deadline to serve them, how do I count the days, and when I do have a hearing, well, what do I need to provide to the court? And the family law rules will provide you with all that information. Might not be the most interesting uh, thing to read, but I think that uh, if you are going through the family process, know that they exist. And as the case progress, refer yourself to them. And as I was stating earlier um, in this morning session, if you don't understand the rules, that's okay. I'll be providing you resources and those resources, again, will be able to help you understand what the rules say, but go out and get those resources. Um, if you do not follow the family law rules, if there's a lawyer on the other side, they may try to put you in default, meaning that you won't be able to proceed for the remaining of the uh, case or they may ask for legal fees again, to be covered uh, by you for their client because you may not have submitted the proper paperwork, which now creates a delay. So be very cautious that those rules exist and you should know them or at least familiarize yourself with them. Um, you also, um, should be aware of the other legislation. The other legislation in this PowerPoint will provide you as to what you're entitled to when you're separating or when you're divorced. How uh, do we figure out who, who will take care of the children? How is child support calculated? So those are all in the other legislation. The family law rules, however, really guide you through uh, the process. I also want to point out that while you're going through your case, any recording is completely uh, forbidden, forbidden uh, whether it's in person, via Zoom, or uh, online, uh, sorry, via telephone. So, okay, you've kind of started your court process. Uh, what are the etiquettes and rules to follow? Um, firstly, make sure that you dress in a business casual clothing. And what I mean by business casual, I think the best way is, would you dress that way to go to a job interview? Um, you should not be wearing hats. 
head covering other than for religious reasons. You should not wear sunglasses. Uh, you shouldn't also wear, um, sorry, clothing with words or images that might be offensive. So again, dress as if you're going to an interview. Uh, be on time for the start of your hearing. This is uh, a, a huge, I'll say, pet peeve. When someone is late, judges don't have much tolerance. The court system, as you are probably aware if you're sitting here today, um, getting a court date can take several months. Uh, the court's time is precious, so be sure to be on time. Leave half an hour early um, to, to make sure you're there. If for some exceptional circumstances you are to be late, please notify someone. Either it's your ex, your ex's lawyer, contact uh, their firm if you can't get a hold of either, either one of them, or call the court directly, but make someone aware that you are running late for that exceptional circumstance. When you are addressing the court, you should always say your honor or your master, depending on who's presiding. Um, when you are speaking to the judge, stand up, um, unless the judge tells you that it's okay to sit or you may stand up and they may allow you to sit afterwards. Speak or argue long enough, but not too long. This isn't a monologue. We are trying to ensure that the process goes forward. Speak slowly and state your point clearly in order to make your argument better. So I learned on a, one of my very first hearing that you cannot speak too fast. I, um, I, I, I had decided that I was gonna read from a case law, so a previous case, uh, a paragraph to the court. And right, you're reading, I looked down and I started reading extremely fast. And then I looked up, having finished my paragraph and the judge looked at me and he said, Ms. Bollier, haven't you noticed I've stopped writing? You speak, you, you went way too quickly slow down and start over. Obviously, I learned my lesson very quickly. I did not want to start over and I simply paraphrased what I had read. Um, but all this to say is that when you speak slowly, you do allow the judge to take notes and notes are usually good. Notes are what the judge will um, use to make his decision. If he hasn't taken it down, he probably won't remember because he's had 10 other cases that day. So, um, and look at that cue again. If the judge is taking notes, it's probably a good sign. If he's not taking notes, it might mean move on to the next uh, point because maybe he or she is not so interested in, in the point you're trying to make at that point. Um, so look for those cues in, uh, when you're looking at the judge. Make sure to never, never interrupt the judge, the court clerk, a lawyer, a witness, or the other side. As outrageous as sometimes family law is, I understand it can be extremely frustrating. You may be facing allegations that you believe are completely outrageous, and you wanna make sure that the judge knows that you feel it's outrageous, but it's not the time to interrupt anyone. You will have an opportunity to speak. And if the judge doesn't specifically ask you to speak, perhaps when there is some silence, you can ask the court, can I address, can I respond to what was said because I don't agree. And then at that point, you'll be able to respond, but do not interrupt. You will get big eyes. <laughs> you will be frowned upon by, um, everyone in the courtroom if you start interrupting. Um, it's normal to be nervous. I think most lawyers are also nervous when going to court. It's okay to admit it. It's also okay to uh, drink from your glass of water because water will be available in the courtroom. And it's okay if you have notes and then everything's going in your head 100 miles per hour, you've just learned a bunch of things. 
um, that you tell the judge, Your Honor, just give me one second. I'd just like to review my notes before I, 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 I before the other one can speak or, or before I finish things up. Don't take 10 minutes, but do take a reasonable amount of time just to review your notes to see whether you've missed anything or not. Um, I also uh, want to make sure that uh, you don't chew gum, you don't eat, drink, as I've stated earlier, do not swear and do not use vulgar language. And um, as I was stating earlier, you'll get a chance to respond. So while the other person is saying whatever they are saying, outrageous or not, take notes of what you want to respond to. And at that, when you get the opportunity, you'll have your speaking points ready to go. If you want to object to uh, a witness or something that is being asked, I would suggest that you simply stand up. You'll be advising the court, I'd like to speak without verbalizing it. And then the judge will usually look at you, nod, tell you to sit down, or he may ask you, okay, what is it uh, that you want to say? But before speaking, make sure you get the permission from the judge or the master. So right now with the pandemic, there are very few cases being heard in person in family law. I think the uh, most cases that are in person are in criminal law. Um, so chances are you will be heard virtually either by phone or uh, via a Zoom conference like today. So before attending those conferences, Make sure to test your microphone and your camera if it's via Zoom. Make sure your device is up to date. We have situation where the device is not to date and will decide to re, uh, sorry, to update itself in the middle of the uh, phone call or the conference, um, which is not what you want to do. Again, you want to be on time. You want to be prepared. Um, you probably want to connect to your meeting five minutes in advance. You may very well be sitting in a waiting room like you did earlier today, or even uh, on the phone, you may be put in the queue. Um, if your hearing is at 9.30 or at 10, it may happen that it's gonna start at 9.35 or 10.05, be patient. If you see that it's really lingering, uh, try to contact someone maybe via email to see if you have uh, the right number. Um, sit in a place that is suitable for a virtual meeting. So A, you are going through a family law case. This is not the time for the children to be running in the background. Um, a, children should probably not be privy to the, the conversation that's about to take place. And two, it can be very distracting. Same for any kind of uh, background noise, whether it's a coffee machine, the television, et cetera, make sure that you're in a quiet place that you won't get disrupted. Uh, I understand not everyone uh, has a lot of room at their place, which is fine. If you feel that there's background noise, I think headphones are just great. They kind of block out, block out the noise and make sure that you're hearing properly as well. Um, when you are not speaking, just like you're doing today, make sure to put your microphone on mute. Uh, same if you're doing it via phone. It's ridiculous the amount of background noise we can hear uh, when we're on a Zoom call or on the phone. All right. so. Now you kind of know who the actors are, how to behave, uh, and what the etiquette is. What are the steps of your case? And that's what usually gets kind of uh, uh, confusing, I'll say. So the first steps or, of your case are the application and the answer. So as I said, the applicant will file his application. They'll submit it to the respondent, and the respondent will uh, provide is or her answer. Those documents are what introduces the matter to the court um, and they are what the court is going to base themselves on to make orders down the road. 
I like to say that my application and my answer do not include all the details of your case, but they are the skeleton. So let's say you are claiming that someone has been abusive or that, yeah, let's take the example of someone has been abusive. Well, don't start enumerating the 15 incidents that took place that states that there is abuse. State, state that there has been abuse, your greatest example, I'll say, or the most outrageous one, and include that in your application. The application, again, is the skeleton, and you'll be able to put flesh on that skeleton as the matter proceeds do not submit a 30 page application or answer chances are it won't get read following your application and answer you will have the mandatory information program as the title states it it is mandatory it's mandatory for anyone um, that is involved in a family law proceeding whether it's a spouse a parent a grandparent everyone needs to get through it um, there they are offered in all Ontario family law courts and they inform participants about separation and divorce. They also inform them about court proceedings and alternative dispute resolution. Um, again, they are mandatory. At the end, they will provide you with a certificate. You must know, be made aware, sorry, that um, if you're given a date, the, the court has ensured that you don't have the exact same date or time slot as your ex. So if you do need to reschedule, you need to advise the court and they will provide you with a new date. It is possible, but you need to contact them. Once you've provided your application and your answer, you will be provided with either a first court date or a conference that is up to the court and it depends on uh, what you are seeking. Uh, if you do get a first court date, it is very procedural. The idea is simply to ensure that everyone has filed their materials and uh, will then, uh, when you appear, you will then be given a conference date. There are three types of conferences that you need to go through before getting to the final stage, which is the trial. Conferences are uh, in place to try to ensure that the, the case moves forward adequately. And it's also to give chances to the parties to resolve all issues or some issues. What you must uh, note is that during conferences, a judge cannot make an order unless it's on consent of both parties, with some few exceptions. But for the majority of the time, um, unless both parties agree, the judge does not have the authority to do so. Even if it's completely urgent, even if you do a backflip in front of the judge, they just don't have that authority. Um, they do have the authority to make uh, orders on financial disclosure. Some judges will also um, make orders on child support, whether it's on consent or not. And I say child support, not spousal support. So those uh, conferences, the very first one is going to be the case conference. At the case conference, uh, the judge will make sure uh, as all the evidence that we need been provided. Otherwise, what are the evidence that either party is seeking to move forward in the case? They, they may as well give their opinion as to the likelihood of success of either party's position and see if there's any chance for resolution. After the case conference, you'll need to go through a settlement conference. A settlement conference, the judge will usually be a bit more um, firm in trying to find resolution to really give the parties a sense as to the likelihood of success or not of each claims being made. Um, and then once you've gone through the settlement conference, you'll also get a trial management conference where the judge may again try to see whether there's any chance of resolution, but the goal is really to manage uh, the trial. So to manage the, the trial, we are looking at 
who's going to be the witnesses, if there's evidence that still needs to be provided, when will it be provided by, do we need interpreters, how long do we believe the trial is going to last, is anything going to be submitted in writing, are there going to be experts, so all of that needs to be prepared in advance of the trial management conference to be scheduled for trial, unless that has taken place, there's no trial that are going to be set. Um, in between the case conference and the settlement conference, because you've started your application and now you're saying, well, when am I ever going to get an order? You are entitled to bring what we call motions. I remember sitting in procedural law class and I was like, what is a motion? What does it eat? I, I, it took me a while to understand. Motions are in place. Uh, they are hearings where a judge can make an order but only a temporary order. So if you're seeking a temporary relief, then uh, you are entitled to bring a motion. What are temporary reliefs? It might be you want more access with your children. That could be one. If there is really important decisions that need immediate attentions to be made for the children. It might be some child support or spousal support. It might be asking for the sale of the home because neither one of you can continue to afford it and you just can't stay in the home. Um, so those are temporary reliefs. It might also be, I absolutely need this disclosure and they are uh, failing to provide it. You can also bring a motion at that point. Um, those can only be heard in between the case conference and the settlement conference. Once the settlement conference has been heard, unless you get authorization from the court, you cannot bring any further motion. So after all of this, after the trial management conference, you then are uh, able to proceed to trial. In family law cases, only 3% of cases actually get to trial. Most cases were able to resolve through the conferences or through negotiation outside of court. Um, this being said, the trial is really the final step in the judicial proceeding. Uh, and at that point, a judge will hear all the evidence and render a decision on all the issues that have not yet been resolved. The trial is really what you see uh, on television where there's someone on the stand being asked questions, um, and, and then the judge takes his or her decision. There is no jury in uh, family law. It is solely a judge that will be hearing your matter. So how do I prepare uh, for a hearing? Any type of hearing, whether it's a conference or a motion, the two first steps are A, to speak with the opposing party and identify the issues that must be resolved and make sure that you understand the other party's uh, position. Um, if you don't understand their position, sometimes it's a miscommunication and people may be very close to a resolution. Uh, make sure to review and familiarize yourself with the evidence, so whatever you'll be presenting, and what the other person has submitted as well. Prepare the materials to be submitted to court. How do we find out what materials need to be submitted? You go back to those family law rules. So, when you have a conference, you'll probably have a brief to submit. If you're going to a motion, you'll need to provide a notice of motion and an affidavit. And it is key to understand um, that if you're going to a motion, all the evidence that you want to put forward absolutely need to be in your affidavit, your sworn statement. Otherwise, you cannot plead it and the judge cannot base himself or herself on anything that you may just decide to verbalize the day of. Um, and then finally, prepare your oral arguments and submissions as to what you're going to be telling the judge uh, specifically. Now, um, when you are presenting your oral submissions, make sure that you have your notes. Um, the judge may ask you to focus on specific uh, questions or evidence make sure to answer the judge's question. If you don't know the answer, say that you don't know the answer. Don't start inventing uh, any response. Make sure to be uh, courteous, 
and don't hesitate to ask for clarification if you don't understand a question or a legal concept that may have been brought up during the hearing. Um, when I say be courteous, the judge may decide to give his decision the day of the hearing, so the, the motion or the trial, or he or she may decide to uh, take time, consider the evidence and arguments, and deliver the decision in writing later. Whether it's done by one way or the other, if, if you do, if you are in court, remain courteous in the sense that if you are winning, don't start dancing and doing a celebration uh, in the hearing itself. And same, if it's not in your favor, don't start arguing with the judge saying that it's completely outrageous, et cetera. You are entitled to a bilingual proceeding. Um, so if you do require a bilingual proceeding, you will need to file your first documents in French. You may also file a requisition form. So to get a motion uh, for the judge to decide whether you can proceed if you are in one of the de designated bilingual areas, you are entitled to proceed uh, in a bilingual uh, in a bilingual way. Um, making an oral statement to the court is another option, and filing a right, written statement is also another option to uh, get your bilingual proceeding. You are also entitled to get interpretation services. They are offered by the court free of charge. You must, however, not, uh, you must do it in an exp expedited way in the sense that as soon as you know that you have a hearing coming up and you know that you'll need an interpreter, don't wait until the last minute because then you may not get one. But if you take yourself in advance, um, the courthouse will be able to provide you the phone number, the contact information, of the interpretation services they use. Um, they will ask you to provide the language of interpretation, who's requesting it, and they will ask you the court location, the time of the hearing, and the date. Uh, and they may ask you any other uh, relevant information. If you do attend in person right now, whether it's for a court hearing or uh, because you want to submit court documents in person, um, because of the pandemic, you will need to fill out an online survey. Once you've filled out the online survey, it's going to give you a green go, which you will need to uh, show to the, before entering the court. Um, you will also be required to uh, wear a mask. You will need to respect social distancing. The courts have worked very hard. They uh, there are now arrows on the ground to make sure on which way of the hallway you need to circulate. There are X's on the chairs if you cannot uh, be sitting on those chairs. There is also um, uh, a indication as to how many people can be in the room or in the elevators. Uh, so just be respectful of those. Um, and whether you go to the court um, in person, sorry, through the COVID period or afterwards, if things ever go back to normal, just be aware that you must go through security in uh, many uh, courthouses in the major cities for sure. Um, there is a metal detector, so security, it's kind of like going to the airport. So what I tell my clients or anyone is whatever you don't need with you that specific day, leave it at home, leave it in the car, um, I had someone who got their tweezers taken away, not necessarily a dangerous item, but it was sharp, it was a pointy object, um, and it was uh, confiscated. If any items get confiscated, you will, uh, you will not be getting those back, uh, even when you leave the courthouse. Um, what I like to tell people in family law is that um, it, while you're waiting in that security line, especially if you're going for a court hearing, you may very well be waiting in line next to um, your ex. Um, and this might be uncomfortable for whatever reason. 
Um, so if you are fearful of that, I may suggest for you to bring a friend to uh, accompany you that day.